Mega Man as a franchise has seen quite the revival this year between the Mega Man Classic Legacy Collections and Mega Man 11, which is only a little over a couple short months away now. But for today, it's Mega Man X's turn in the spotlight on Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC with... Mega Man X Legacy Collection. What that guy said. We've gone back and assembled the pieces of the ultimate armor, I mean the ultimate review, where I'll be discussing everything in extreme detail, including Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1, which contains Mega Man X, X2, X3, and X4, Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2, which harbors Mega Man X5, X6, X7, and X8, and as far as games go, that's all you get. There's no Maverick Hunter X, no Command Mission, nor the extreme games in these collections nor are there any plans to add them at the moment. So, sorry guys, I want to command Mission HD 2, then finally all of the lovely extra features, including the highly anticipated X challenge, where we will find out if it lived up to the hype. Let's rock. The Mega Man X series takes place in the year 21XX, 100 years in the future from the Mega Man Classic series. Mega Man X, more commonly known as just X, is not the same robot as the previous Mega Man that we all know and love but they do share their creator in common, Dr. Thomas Light. Dr. Light built X as a new type of robot with the ability to think, worry, grow, and make its own decisions, creating a new connection between humans and robots. Realizing that the world would not be ready for X because of the potential danger that free thinking robot possesses and being at the end of his life, Dr. Light decides to seal X away in a diagnostic capsule for 30 years of testing. 100 years later, X's capsule was discovered by Dr. Kane. Excited by the possibilities that X presented, Dr. King uses X's design concept to give birth to a new breed of robots that also possess free will, known as Reploids. However, as Dr. Light warned in the logs in X's capsule, a free-thinking robot comes with their own risk as well. Eventually, a virus spreads that turns some Reploids against the humans and seek to harm them. These Reploids are referred to as Mavericks, and an organization known as the Maverick Hunters was formed to combat the threat. Mega Man X eventually joins the Maverick Hunters along with his best friend Zero. The Maverick Hunters were led by Sigma until he too became a Maverick and declared war against the humans, thus setting forward the events of the Maverick Wars and the Mega Man X games where X and Zero repeatedly fight against Sigma to protect humanity. I could get into a lot more lore here like who created Zero, where did the Maverick virus even come from, but that's the basics of what you need to know to get started. I wouldn't rob anyone new to the series from finding out for themselves by playing the games anyway, since one of the key elements that sets the X series apart from the classic series is the larger emphasis on storytelling. How do the 8 mainline X titles hold up in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2 then? First, some general things. I can say that none of the games in the X Legacy Collection had any input lag issues, so the controls are just fine the way I remember them. I would be here all day if I had to give a full review on every game. So I'm going to quickly tell you what each game is about, what I think about them, and tell you any changes, if any, that have been made to the Legacy Collection version over the original release. When Capcom looked to bring Mega Man to the Super Nintendo console, they knew that they couldn't just release the same old formula of Mega Man titles again. Mega Man needed a makeover, an evolution of the formula. That evolution gave birth to a new type of Mega Man game, Mega Man X. The first entry in the X series is one of the rare examples of the first entry of a Mega Man sub-series getting the formula darn near perfect on the first try. And it just so happens to be my personal favorite video game of all time. In addition to the basic Mega Man formula of taking on 8 bosses in any order, stealing their powers and using them against the other bosses, the X series introduces a whole new set of abilities and concepts to spice things up. X's wall kick allows you to scale walls of ease adding a whole new dimension to how you think about traversing stages and dodging attacks. Plus, it's a ton of fun, man. In addition, Capcom introduced RPG-like elements in Mega Man X. Scattered around each level are health upgrades, sub-tanks to store energy in that can be used to recover your health later, and the big one, armor upgrades, courtesy of the good Doctor, Doctor Light. Each X game features their own unique armor for X that grants them special abilities like reduced damage, more powerful attacks, and it also introduced a series stable dashing mechanic that gives your character an extra burst of speed with the press of a button. Great for speeding through stages, gaining greater jump height, and evading enemies. Another series stable introduced is the Ride Armors, armored carriers that you can hop in and wreck everyone with your fists of steel. Mega Man X1 isn't all innovation though, 
It's also an amazing video game and definitely one of the best Super Nintendo games out there. The story setup that makes you want to get stronger to get back a vial, the Maverick bosses, levels, music, sound effects, everything here is so iconic. I also love how stages will change depending on the bosses you defeat, like Chill Penguin freezing over Flame Mammoth stage, or Storm Eagle's airship crashing into Spark Mandrel stage, knocking out the power. There's so much excellent stuff I could talk about, but you get the idea. Of course, I can't mention Mega Man X without bringing it up, right on cars! Need I say more, really? If you haven't played Mega Man X1 yet, you should do it now. You're really missing out. As for X1 differences, the only major one that is true for all the Super Nintendo titles featured in this collection is the addition of the save feature. The caveat to the save feature though is that it merely records the passwords and re-inputs them when you load a save. That means the secret Hadouken move and Sigma Palace progress is not saved, so you'll still have to re-obtain the Hadouken every time you start up the game. By the way, you can still use the password system as it was originally, so if you want to skip to the final stages of all upgrades immediately, you totally can. The only other things I notice is that certain areas like the B mini boss in the intro stage has significantly less lag than before. But that's not to say that lag is entirely gone, because lag was present in practically every other area throughout the game that I noticed. And that's literally it. Nothing else has really changed. Even the infamous Horming Torpedo typo is still there. Lastly, they're using the original SNES translation, because X doesn't swear here in the intro like they added in the older X collection. The sequel, Mega Man X2, takes what X1 did well and expands on it a bit. From this game on, dashing is always a default ability for X and dash jumping controls have been tying up a little. There's a new armor that introduces the double charge shot which is insanely powerful as well as the air dash and the giga crush, a screen white nuke that energy is charged up for when you take damage. X2's story focuses on the X hunters who want to destroy X and claim zero for themselves. They introduce a side quest where you can challenge them in the middle of the stages to fight for certain parts that can slightly change how the final boss gauntlet goes down depending on if you get all three parts or not. Other than that, X2 has some memorable set pieces of its own. Who can forget the green biker dude? Right on, buddy! Oh, rest in peace, green biker dude. X2 might not beat out X1 and X1 in my eyes, but I will say it's a pretty good sequel. Not much going on for changes here, though I did encounter one issue. You can remap your controls and the options of each of the X games, but one time, I closed the game and came back to it later, and the controls were reset back to default even after I loaded the save myself. It's probably due to the way the password system works, but I thought it'd be worth mentioning anyway. This is also a good time for me to mention that gripe I have with the control mapping options in X1 through X3. Since the games were designed with the SNES controller, there aren't as many buttons available compared to the Switch controller. As a side effect, I cannot map the dash button to ZL like I normally do for X4 through X8. So I had to settle for just the L shoulder button, which is manageable but not ideal for me. So I would like to see a patch in the future letting the trigger buttons be mappable. It would help with weapon swapping too. Oh, and I noticed some lag was improved in X2 as well, like in the optional surges fight where the game used to always lag when you fired off shots. That has been greatly reduced in this port. Mega Man X3's new villain is Dr. Doppler. At some point after building his own Doppler town for Reploids, he goes Maverick and turns on the humans. Later, while X and Zero are dispatched, they get a call that Maverick Hunter headquarters is under attack, so that ends up being the starting point of our third adventure. Now, X3 was pretty ambitious for its time. They attempted to integrate Zero as a playable character, let you collect ride armors to use it at will at set points in the stage, and there is the bits, by and returning vile side quests where depending on how you defeat them, it will change up the final Doppler stages. All pretty cool concepts on paper, but they had some pretty flawed execution for various reasons. Other flaws include the high contact damage, super exploitable AI, the tendency of bosses to run into walls, and the very convoluted quest to get 100% items. Many of the items require you to get certain armor upgrades or special weapons to actually get them causing you to take a lot of stage revisits. I'm not a fan of the crossing charge shot that the arm part gives you to be honest either. I always prefer having the regular buster. X3 also has the worst soundtrack in the series in my opinion. Nothing against the compositions of the tunes themselves. They're fine and a few tracks stand out. It's the Super Nintendo version instruments that really grates on my ears. It's just noise to me really. I'm actually a bigger fan of the controversial PlayStation version soundtrack because for its copious amounts of synth rock, 
It at least has better quality instruments. Unfortunately for fans of that version like I am, that is nowhere to be found in Mega Man X Legacy Collection. Trust me, I looked. For all of X3's flaws though, I found the stage is still fun to play through and I do like the bits, bile, and vile idea since it changes up things on repeat playthroughs. So I would say X3 is a fine entry. Once again, X3 doesn't have any real changes from the original aside from the save feature. I should note however that this is indeed the Super Nintendo version in Mega Man X Legacy Collection. The PS1 game and its soundtrack is nowhere to be found in this collection sadly. They really should have included an option for these things. Mega Man X4 marks the Maverick Hunter's first foray into the 32-bit area of gaming. Taking advantage of the new hardware, there is more of a focus on story, this time following an organization known as Repiforce as they declare independence after they were wrongfully labeled as Mavericks, albeit for the silliest reason imaginable. Colonel, you need a chill bro. The storyline is accompanied by animated cutscenes that are quite well done for the time. Despite the very cheesy English voice acting which is all still here and accounted for, X4's English cast is carried over from Mega Man 8's dub, so X sounds like a girl, and lines are delivered awkwardly to much hilarity. Zero, if, if I become a maverick, you have to take care of me. The dub also gave the infamous WHAT AM I FIGHTING FOR? But hey, you can always switch to the Japanese version with the press of a Y button on the Switch on the main menu if you want to hear that voice acting instead. There's no English subtitles though, sadly. Zero is now his own fully playable character with his own tragic storyline. Zero's brilliant yet maniacal creator is also revealed right from the start, something that is occasionally hinted at throughout the series. Unlike X, Zero is a close range character mainly relying on his Z Saber's 3 hit combo to dish out damage. And not to mention the slash dash cancel exploit is still here too. And instead of weapons, Zero learns new techniques from Maverick bosses that adds to his moveset. He's a lot of fun to play as and is a refreshing break from X's run and gun gameplay. Despite the new visuals, X and Zero do not lose a spring in their step. In fact, X4 is arguably the best game in the series right up there of X1. Gameplay is as tight as ever, the Mavericks suffer a bit from Spark Mandrel Syndrome, but they are super fun to fight Buster only. The stages themselves are a blast too, with some creative concepts like a cyber maze, a running cargo train, and an air force base. Unfortunately, the game starts to fall short in its very short lived final stages with which there are only three of them. They still offer some story and the levels are designed to take advantage of your new weapons so they're not bad, it's just a shame that the finale of the game goes by so quickly. But hey, at least the music is phenomenal, led by an emotional opening stage theme for X that absolutely nails his character as a whole. Now here's the changes that I found for Mega Man X4. This one is true for both X4 and X5 at least, but some of the sound effects like the cursor, confirmed, text scrolling, and explosions sounded ever so slightly different from the original. I am not sure if it's a sound emulation issue or an intentional quirk for Mega Man X Legacy Collection, but it's there. I only noticed it because the original game is still fresh in my mind though, so it might not be a bother for most. It's really out to preference whether this is a bad or good thing in the first place. The original Japanese version of X4 featured a pop song, and in the English release of Mega Man X Legacy Collection, that song is completely removed. You can still play the Japanese animation, but the western intro music will play over it instead. This is true for all the games in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2, likely due to licensing issues. Speaking of the intro movie, I found one jarring change that's present in both the English and Japanese version. There's one particular section towards the beginning that looks purposefully slowed down, effectively cutting out a scene with the general holding his hand forward. Here, watch for yourself with the original on the left and Mega Man X Legacy Collection on the right. See? Weird, right? I really don't know why this change was made, but wow. On that topic, Obviously you can also tell that none of the cutscenes were remastered so they're still blurry like before. That's to be expected though. One more thing, the loading times are much better in this version of X4, they're almost non-existent in fact. Nice! Now we've entered Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2 territory. The second collection contains Mega Man X5, X6, X7, and X8. 
This is arguably where the X series began to take a dip in overall quality, and then a sharp fall from grace, but ultimately temporary. Capcom certainly took a risk splitting up the collections this way since the games in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 are clearly superior to 2. With that said, let's take a deep dive into the ending of Mega Man X's adventures. Mega Man X5 is a fine game for what it's worth. I love the storyline that goes deeper into Zero's origins, and features an epic battle between X and Zero accompanied by a fan favorite tune. Sigma's goal in this game is to spread the Maverick virus everywhere by crashing the space colony into the Earth, for the sole purpose of turning Zero into a Maverick, or rather awaken his true form. The goal of the game is to stop the space colony from crash landing by collecting parts for the Enigma and the space shuttle that someone has to pilot and have it collide with the station. Whether you are successful or not in this mission determines whether you get the good or bad endings of X5. An early success though means you can tackle the final stages of the game right from the start if luck is truly on your side. Which is an interesting concept. Too bad the Enigma and the shuttle is still purely RNG whether they work or not. Yep, the RNG is still as strong as it was before. I still got the bad ending even though I beat all the 8 Mavericks and collected all the parts beforehand. Now that is some booty cheeks. At least you can simply reload your save if you get a result that you don't want, but there is an argument to be made that you shouldn't have to. You have a set time limit before the space colony crashes too, with 1 hour passing by each time you enter a stage. The time limit is very generous though, so you would have to purposefully run it down to trigger the cutscene that leads to the bad ending. Helping with running down that timer is a new antagonist introduced called Dynamo, who shows up a couple of times throughout the game just because Sigma told him to bother you. He's a pretty carefree guy, and the boss fight and music is amusing, so this guy is a cool little side villain in my book. You'll be seeing more of him in X6 too. Even though the story is actually quite interesting and it's what turned me into a Mega Man nerd in the first place when I first played it, it's hard to ignore X5's glaring problems. Chief among them is a new navigator introduced in this game named Alia. The problem with Alia is that she will literally interrupt you mid-stage multiple times to tell you obvious things like... The ceiling is falling! Watch out! Mega Man! Mega Man! I'm stopping you to tell you that Lobo is going to kill you if you don't hurry! Mega Man! Mega Man! I know you've seen the world four times now, but have you ever learned how to wall jump? Mega Man! Mega Man! Spikes! Jeez, it's one thing to teach the player how to play the game, but it's another to invade the player's playtime for no good reason. And she does this for every single stage until you reach the final stages. Good lord woman! And yep, if you already couldn't tell, she still does this in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2. I could not for the life of me find any options to turn her off, even after I cleared the game once. You know what's funny? X5 is the first and only Mega Man X game to have a training mode, where Alia explains all the basics of playing the game to you. So then why was this needed for the main adventure to begin with? There's also no skip button for the lengthy cutscenes either. Then we can get into the parts system that is a nice addition on paper, but actually obtaining the parts is a confusing process that you'd have to look up a guide to know what you're dealing with, or how any heart tanks you get only applies to either X or Zero rather than both characters. An issue that would carry on for the next couple of games until X8. For armors, X5 also does this silly thing that for story reasons, X cannot equip an armor that he gets from the light capsules until all four parts are acquired. I can see why they did it, since mixing and matching armors wasn't a thing until X8, but still kind of disappointing. At least the armors that you do get are nice, if gimmicky. The Falcon armor is all about maneuverability, allowing you to fly around the stage and reach high up places, but it's not that great in offensive power. However, the Falcon armor is required to gather the parts for the Gaia armor that's pretty slow and cannot use special weapons nor equip parts but it is an absolutely monstrous boss killer and can walk on spikes safely, which is also required to get some upgrade items. Yeah, backtracking is a thing in this game, sort of like X3. X can also keep the fourth armor from X4 if you start the intro stage as him. It's been nerfed from X4, but still remains a powerful armor that breaks most of the early game. If you start the game as Zero, he has the Z Buster, but it's not that good in this game. You're better off with the fourth armor to be honest. By the way, the cheat codes that gives you the ultimate armor and Black Zero early is still here and functional. Cheat codes are still a thing in X4, X6, and X8 as well, so try them out! 
Just make sure you substitute the circle button for the B button if you are playing on Nintendo Switch. X5 is also the first game to have the red points that need to be rescued throughout the stages, although they do nothing in X5 other than give you an extra life and recover some health. The red points will serve more of a useful purpose in X6 and X7 though. Lives are pointless in this game by the way, because continuing from a game over screen still puts you back at your last checkpoint. X6 and X7 does this too. But hey, X5 isn't a bad game by any means in my opinion. Like I said, the story is cool albeit it's now told through a slideshow. To be fair though, not having voice anime cutscenes may actually have been to X5's benefit. Because if we had X4 quality voice acting again, it would have sucked all the seriousness out of an otherwise tragic and emotional story. Plus, since we're coming from X4's engine, the gameplay is solid. One nice thing X5 added to the Maverick Hunter's moveset is the ability to crouch, making it possible to duck underneath attacks and deal with smaller enemies on the ground. Sounds simple, but the crouch is pretty useful in some spots, and I keep wishing I had it whenever I go back to X4. As is tradition with Mega Man games at this point, X5's soundtrack is pretty great too. The aforementioned X vs Zero theme, the mysterious Zero stage themes, Maverick stage themes like Volt Kraken or Shining Firefly, Dynamo's theme, the final stage theme that makes you feel like this is really the finale, I could go on, but you get the idea. The levels are alright too, even though they have seen a noticeable degradation in quality. Squid Adler's Ride Chaser section is trial and error to level though. I mean, uh, his name is Volt Kraken now. Right, I almost forgot about that. Staying true to their word, Capcom has indeed went into X5 and replaced all instances of the Mavericks Guns and Roses names in favor of localizing their Japanese names. And I do mean all instances. The Guns N' Roses references are now a complete thing of the past. Here's the full list of the name changes. Grizzly Slash is now Crescent Grizzly. Izzy Glow is now Shining Firefly. Squid Alor is now Volt Kraken. Duff McWhalian is now Tidal Whale. Disguiver is now Spiral Pegasus. Axel the Red is now Spike Rose Red. Dark Dizzy is now Dark Necrobat. And finally, Matrix is now known as Burn Dino Rex. Welp, rest in peace, Duff McWhalen. It was nice knowing you, buddy. I found at least one other localization improvement in X5. X talks to him about Launch Octopus from X1. In the old translation, it was spelled Octopardo, his Japanese name. However, that error has now been fixed to correctly say Octopus. Neat. Aside from the sound effect changes I noted with X4 in my X Legacy Question 1 review, there was no other big changes to the game otherwise. The loading times are much improved in X5 as well. I loved X5 when I first played it as a youngling, and while I acknowledge its problems in the present, I can't deny that I still have some nostalgia for this game. I still quite like this game, even though being able to turn off Ilya and skipping cutscenes would have made this game a lot better for repeat playthroughs. Fun fact, X5 was originally intended to be the finale for the Mega Man X series, and had it gone that way, X5 would be a fitting, if average, ending to X and Zero's adventures. But nope, we still got three more games anyway, so now it's time to begin the road down controversial X title lane. Oh boy. First we have Mega Man X6. The story picks up from where X5 leaves off, with X carrying Zero's saber with him for spoiler reasons, and going about his Maverick Hunter days. Meanwhile, a researcher named Gate randomly comes across a piece of Zero's DNA while looking through the wreckage of the space colony from X5. He uses Zero's DNA to craft powerful reploids, like High Max, to do his bidding, and proclaims that he will create a world just for reploids. Also, Zero's spooky ghost is hanging around, and it's got everybody understandably spooked. That is until it turns out that Zero hit himself while he tried to repair himself all along. Silly Zero. Also, can we talk about their faces in this scene? Those are some of the most genuinely happy faces I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, the bromance has been heating up between X and Zero ever since X5. And yup, the translation is still the same as the original English release. But hey, at least the Japanese voice acting is back in after its absence from the old X collection. For what it's worth, X6 is based in the same engine as X4 and X5, so the controls and graphics are still fine on par with those games. Although, the fact that they mapped X's air dash to pressing the jump button twice is an odd addition and can mess up someone not used to it. 
Adding the Z Saber to X's default special weapon button was cool too and makes story sense. Although naturally X isn't as adept at the Saber as Zero, so its use is limited to a few spots that require it. The real issue is the level design. For whatever reason, when this game was created, the developers apparently decided to make the most brutally difficult X game that they could. There are many instances of needlessly difficult or unfair level design and enemy placement so ridiculous that you might want to take damage on purpose just to bypass them. One of the most infamous examples is the couple points in the game where normal X simply cannot progress through without the help of specific parts. Parts that you have to rescue Repoids to obtain. However, nightmare enemies can kill the Repoids before you get to them. So if a Repoid with a part you needed is killed, uh, yeah, good luck with that, buddy. Combine that with a nightmare system that changes the stages in various ways that mostly hinder you, and you have the most frustratingly difficult X game in the series. Speaking of those pesky nightmare viruses, defeating them spawns nightmare souls. Collecting them raises your points and your hunter rank. You also get 200 nightmare souls from defeating any of the maverick bosses. This is important because from the outset, you can't actually equip any parts to your character until he reaches a certain rank. Also, the requirements to reach the later ranks is absurd, so if you aren't grinding it out, most people will only get to equip two normal parts and one special part on a typical playthrough. If you do want to grind, Dynamo is back in this game as a secret boss, and if you abuse his weakness, he'll drop up to 600 points of souls per fight, making him the ideal grinding spot. The quality of boss battles varies wildly too. There's some fun ones like Metal Shark Player, Blizzard Wolfang, and Ready Turtoloid. Then there's the annoying or downright absurd bosses like Infinity Maginion and Nightmare Mother, even Gate himself. X6's stages has several alternate paths too that lead to secret bosses, more power-ups, and etc. I do like this exploratory element, but it comes with the caveat that you'll have to revisit every stage at least twice to get everything. Also, you cannot escape from the alternate sections even if you cleared the stage once already. So I hope you're prepared for high max if you find yourself in one a second time. This game has some glitches that can help you brute force your way through, mostly involving Zero. The guard shell still makes the Z-Saber absolutely broken, making every frame that the Saber is on screen count as a hit. And then there's the Ensuizon glitch, where if you interrupt the animation at any point by making Zero fall, his hitbox will disappear, making him walk through all enemies like the spooky boy he is, until you hit a door or activate a light capsule. That glitch is abusable on a few stages, and the guard shell trick works on most bosses and enemies. So keep that pro tip in mind whenever you find yourself playing Mega Man X6. Don't forget that Zero Z Buster makes for a very powerful damage dealer in X6 as well. Two nice things I'll say about X6 is the soundtrack is absolutely rocking, man. I dare say one of the best soundtracks in the series. The other one is X6 fixes the Elia problem we were having back in X5. Now she is made optional so you don't have to listen to her rabble unless you press the right stick when the icon appears. I like X's new armors too, being the blade armor and the shadow armor. Blade armor has a really lengthy dash that you can go in four directions which is useful. Shadow armor can't use special weapons, but it does have a more powerful charged saber and can ignore spikes, making it super useful for the final gate stages. Of course, you still have to collect all four parts of an armor to wear it, so that still stinks. X retains its falcon armor from X5 too, but its flight ability has been reduced to a simple air dash with a slight damaging property to it. So it's honestly useless once you get access to Zero or one of the other armors. Now I have a few changes to document about X6. The first is truly shocking, or should I say nightmarish. If you played X6 on the PS1, you'll probably remember that the intro movie and the ending credits were accompanied by the original Japanese songs, Moonlight and Idea. Like with the rest of the Japanese songs in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2, these songs are now too entirely removed from X6 even when switching over to Rockman X6. In its place is an entirely new piece of music for the X Legacy Collection 2 version. The music isn't bad and it sort of fits, I guess, but it doesn't give the intro that same punch that Moonlight did, which I loved as a kid when I picked up X6 at launch. It's just there. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but this change was definitely deliberate. Clearly their license for the songs expired, and licensing can be as nightmarish as X6 itself. So that is the most likely reason this occurred. The ending credits theme has changed too. I have a video up right now that you can listen to yourself. I have some good news though. 
If you import the Japanese version, Rockman X Anniversary Collection 2, you can play the English version of Mega Man X6 with the Moonlight Song on the intro. So good stuff! Importing from Japan is definitely something you should look into if you want the Japanese songs, since all of them are included in that version, even in the music gallery. That's not the only music related change in X6. The intro stage theme has been changed from its English version with the electric guitar riffs to the Japanese version that lacks those electric guitars. Take a listen for yourself to hear what I'm talking about. Now about one of Zero's techniques that he learns from Ground Scarevich, dub the Sensuazan. This move makes Zero come crashing down at a slant, and the move is non-cancelable. In the original game, the move was activated by pressing up and attack. This was a problem because in certain sections where you have to press up to ride out the ropes, it's too easy to accidentally press up and attack at the same time. If you do, dumb goof, Zero will go crashing down to the pit below with no way to come back. Back when the original Mega Man X collection came out, Fans asked Capcom to change the combination to down and attack, and they almost did it, even changing the in-game description to read that combination. Unfortunately, however, a programmer messed up and made the combination up and attack again. So surely after that goof up, they corrected it this time, right? <laughs> nope! It's still up and attack. It's hilarious because the game still tells you down and attack like in the old collection. So did they goof up again? Who knows man, but there's your burning question answered. The Sensuazan is still going to be a problem going forward in this version. Would be nice if Capcom notices and patches it though. One last small note someone wanted me to investigate, the Hyper Dash and Speedster parts have their pictures switched in the original, and that still appears to be the case in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2. As for the X series debut on the PlayStation 2, Mega Man X7. <laughs> Seven. The game that tried to incorporate 3D gameplay into an X game and quite honestly fell flat on its face doing it. Fixed camera angles that messes up your depth perception, the lock on system that trivializes everything, and the fact that you can literally ignore enemies in a lot of sections. Not to mention the controls in X7 could be a lot better. They're a bit awkward, especially when you're wall kicking because the characters jump away from the wall at such a wide distance. Also, you have to use the L and R shoulder buttons to move the camera, but special weapon swapping is done with the right stick. How backwards is that? X7 isn't the first Mega Man game to have 3D gameplay. That title belongs to the Mega Man Legends series, and even being on the older PS1 hardware, it still handled 3D gameplay a lot better than X7. The music is pretty good though. Most of the tracks weren't very memorable to me, but listening to the tracks again recently, I do acknowledge the standout tracks like Our Blood Boils. The 3D thing didn't really work out for X7, but one feature that they introduced that I can appreciate is the character change mechanic. Now you can bring two characters at once, or in other words, just Zero and Axel, into the missions. This adds some variety to the gameplay, where you can switch between characters when a situation suits them best or when one of your character's health drops low, since both characters have their own separate health bars. This mechanic will be expanded on more for X8, but points to X7 for introducing it. Heh, <laughs> just kidding. Mega Man Extreme 2 on the Game Boy Color did character changing first two years prior to X7, but I guess you could say that X7 still brought it to the mainline games. I also have to say, I like how they handled the upgrade system here. Letting you choose between attack, power, speed, or other abilities with chips you get from rescued reploids. Too bad once again, it's too easy to let the reploids die. Hang in there buddy, I'm coming to rescue you. Oh. There's still a problem with this upgrade system though. You have to use up your chips as soon as you get them, so you cannot save them and make a decision later on what you want to do. Also, Elia will remind you every single time you use a chip that Reploids will give you helpful chips! Like, like Elia, please, we've had enough of you from X5. But nope, she is back in full force in this game. Holy crap. When you're in the stages at certain points, she will keep saying over and over, Can you hear me, Zero? Can you hear me? 
I mean, it's not X5 bad per se, but it's still pretty hilariously bad. On that topic, another thing about X7 is that everything takes so freaking long. The text scrolls so slow, getting through the menus is also extremely slow. That's why most people prefer to play this game on New Game Plus mode, because the first time you're playing through this game, everything just takes so long for them to explain everything to you, and yeah, it's just a slog. Other than that, it's the same good old X7. Your favorite characters are all here, such as Whiny X. That's quite enough! You need to back off and pay the deuce for your crimes! Why must Reploids continue this accursed cycle of aggression? Microsoft Zero. We're not getting anywhere with this. I'm ready to go. And of course, Here goes nothing! You punch! You punch! You punch! You punch! Around and around! Over here! Later! I hated you from the very beginning. Well, that makes two of us. Why, you brat? You won't pay for this. Oh, it's you that's causing my suffering. Then if I tear you to pieces, the pain will stop. Don't worry, I have just the cure. They're all here just the way you loved them before. Yes, the memes live on. Boss HP values for the English version still seem to be higher over the Japanese version too. Hey guys, by the way, did you notice that it's called Mega Man X7? I mean, he's featured prominently on the front of the cover for goodness sake, but nope. X decides to hang out on the couch all game because I've had enough violence. No, I'm serious. When you see X in the first cutscene he is in, he's literally sitting on the couch. What? So yeah, he literally takes a backseat to this whole adventure until you rescue 64 Reploids, at which point X decides to join the fight again. And Zero is like, Okay, do as you please. Yeah, even Zero is tired of X's whining, and probably the situation as a whole. I would be too, man. This right here is the thing I hate about X7 the most. It took one of my all-time favorite characters and made him the most unlikable guy on the planet, all in one game. I will say it's an accomplishment that X7 even pulled that off. Bravo! At least X7 only has one armor to get, so you can equip it immediately again for the first time since X5. But, you'll be waiting a minimum of 5 stages to actually unlock X, and by then he won't have the power-ups that Axel and Zero have. And that's the thing, X7 introduces the new playable character Axel. He's not a bad kid, despite his voice acting doing him no favors, resulting in a very bad first impression for the poor guy. Zero, you're my hero! Hey, I knew you'd understand! I always thought you and X were so cool! I want to fight! I want to be a maverick hunter! But boy did they push this new character hard! That this game may as well have been called Mega Man Axel. Axel's gimmick is he can transform to other Reploids his size, and his former game called Red Alert wants him back because his copy ability is so amazing. Even though in gameplay, it's a pain in the butt to use because the copy shot does like no damage and you have to deal the final blow to an enemy with the copy shot for the transformation to work. You're honestly better off doing without it where you can. Otherwise, he uses a pair of pistols as his main weapon and his design is pretty cool. But yeah, where's Mega Man? Oh, right. I've had enough violence. Okay, there's a few changes to document for X7. The graphics in X7 has been cleaned up and resolution bumped to HD quality. Not that it helps the art style any. This is still a PS2 game after all. The loading times have also seen a significant improvement. They are definitely way snappier than before, lasting only a couple seconds at the longest now, even on the Switch's handheld mode. That means the boss comment won't take a million years now. Yay! For most of us that can't stand X7's ear grating English voice acting, you can change the Japanese voices in the options menu. And this time, even the exclamations and phrases you hear in the game will use the Japanese voice clips when it actually wasn't that way before. The character Elusive Cigar, which was removed in the English version, is now gone in the Japanese version too. Last on our list. Mega Man X6 wasn't the only game that had music altered. X7's ending credits theme has been altered too, replacing the rock music for a techno e tune. Take a listen. And while on my quest to beat Mega Man X7 to show you guys this, 
I encountered something very weird and hilarious at the same time. I was in the boss gauntlet at the Crimson Palace, which is the final stage, and getting ready for the rematch with... Soldier Stone Kong! He's the loyalist of the bunch. You know him well. He's finally back to Jack out of life. What? Wow, he really did Jack out of life. Wow, be. Yep, that's an odd glitch. This definitely has never happened in the PS2 version. It's been found that in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2, Soldier Stone Kong has a tendency to hop on the wall and poof out of existence whenever he reaches half health. This happened to me seven times in a row too. Nothing was helping. I'm not the only one who had this glitch happen to them either. Other people on Twitter shared the same experience and told me that restarting the game and console helped them. But when I went to close the game, Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2 crashed actually. Welp. So yeah, there's definitely something funky going on with X7 there. 30 minutes of redoing gameplay later, I finally got back to Soldier Stone Kong and yep, the fight worked as intended once again. Still, the thing about the final Crimson Palace level is it is super long for no reason. You do a small section, fight the leader Red Alert Red, which is a pretty long fight in itself, do another few sections, fight the usual boss gauntlet, and then the final boss. All in one level, no breaks in between. So turning off the game means you have to do that level all over again. A level that averages a whopping 40 minutes to clear. Making this glitch that blocks your way forward right at the end literally inexcusable. I hope this glitch gets patched because man, forcing the player to redo up to 30 minutes of gameplay just because of a glitch you won't know what's going to happen until you get there is not good. That's it, moving right along to Mega Man X8, which thankfully left the X series on a very high note. For the first time, they finally got competent voice acting in an X game. Mark got that as X, Lucas Gilbertson as Zero, and Jeffrey Watson as Axel, among others, all do an excellent job of their individual roles. To this day, they remain my favorite takes on the main X series cast because they fit so well. Darn! X? What's the matter? The mission's only just begun. That's right. It's begun again. How long must this war go on? Just the thought of wiping the floor with those mavericks makes my trigger finger itch. Axel! No, Alia. Axel's right. There's no time to be wishy-washy here. Even as we speak, mavericks are causing havoc. Axel, pick up the pace. This is no time to slack off. You show up late and have the nerve to complain? I can more than handle a few Mavericks all by myself anyway. That's the spirit. Let's move. In the story of Mega Man X8, being wary of the ongoing Maverick outbreaks, humans have begun migrations to the moon, thanks to the Jacob Project, which involves the construction of an orbital elevator ran by a new generation rep boy named Lumine. I could never tell if this is a dude or a chick, but apparently it's a dude. Alrighty then. Other highly advanced new generation Reploids have been created as well to work on the moon. These Reploids are also said to be immune to the Maverick virus. However, while X, Zero, and Axel are out on a mission, Vile makes a comeback, kidnaps Lumine, and runs off. Afterwards, several Maverick attacks break out across the world. So now, the Maverick Hunters are tasked with doing what they do best while also searching for Lumine. In the gameplay department, X8 took a step back from the 3D thing that X7 tried and focused on delivering a solid 2.5D game. This was definitely for the better. The main issue one might bring up about X8 is that the stages relied too heavily on gimmicks, but those gimmicks still resulted in a pretty varied experience where no two levels play quite the same. I'm also happy to report that the controls are tight and responsive again, a massive improvement over X7. Another point in Mega Man X8's favor is they made a smart compromise on the navigator situation. X8 introduces new navigators. Lair, who is fairly quiet but specializes in boss tactics, has a cute crush on Zero, and that design though. And Palette, who talks you through the R&D lab and menus, plus specializing in helping you to find secrets in the stages. Alia is back too, of course, and she's the more balanced navigator in terms of what she tells you. The best part is though, now you can straight up turn off the navigators if you don't want to hear any of it. Great! The boss fights are also a good round of fun as it should be. Occasionally, Vile will show up mid-stage to bother you just like the good old days. 
And man, his battle theme is so good, it's vile. That was such a bad poem. Most of X8's music goes a bit too hard on the heavy metal for my taste, but there are definitely some standout tracks here. For upgrades, X8 finally dropped the Rescuing Reploids thing in favor of hiding rare metals throughout the stages, so there's an element of finding secrets all over the place. Some of the locations are really obscure too. There's also a new form of currency and metals that are dropped from enemies, bosses, and found all over the stages. They can be spent in the R&D lab for upgrades to our three heroes. X8 also brings an interesting concept for X's armor. Getting to one light capsule will automatically give you the full neutral armor. The neat thing about the neutral armor is you can get up to 8 parts for it to make either the Hermes or the Icarus armor. Furthermore, you can mix and match parts to customize your X however you prefer. However, completing one of the two armor sets will increase your abilities further and give you a giga ability. On the topic of metals, there was a glitch in the original PS2 version where you get a life tank, then you could try to buy a life tank refill when you had less than 50 metals. The game would glitch out and allow you to max out your metal count, making buying upgrades a trivial affair. I was curious if the glitch is still around in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2, and nope! It does not work at all. So yeah, it looks like that glitch was indeed patched. Back to grinding metals the hard way then. One other glitch that has been patched is the one involving Zero's technique where he literally spins in the air. You could actually propel Zero upward in the air indefinitely, which was pretty hilarious, and it did help you get a rare metal early. Not anymore though, since the glitch has been fixed up. The absence of these glitches further cements my personal theory that this version of X8 is based off the PC port that features 60 frames per second gameplay, and it didn't have the glitch either as far as I understand. And yep, X8 runs a silky smooth 60 frames per second from my experience, and like with X7, the visuals are up res to HD. X8 looks super clean now, and the up res makes the environments like Noah's Park pop with beauty. It's a real treat to look at. Just don't expect total remake like transformations, since we are still talking about the PS2. Also just like X7, X8 was also originally known for its lengthy load times. And I am once again happy to report that X8's load time issue has been fixed as well. The load times are super fast, like 1 second fast now. It is almost instant. Stages load up in a blink of an eye, even while I was playing on the Switch's handheld mode. In general, all of the 8 Mega Man X games run just perfectly on the Switch in handheld mode, as it does in TV mode, which is really nice. But yeah, Mega Man X8 was definitely a worthy entry to end the X series off on. It might not live up to Mega Man X1 or Mega Man X4, but it is definitely a great game all its own. It is packed with so many secrets and extra content too that it's just crazy. I would definitely recommend picking up Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2 if only to play X5 and X8. Mega Man X8 got skipped by a lot of people due to X7's infamy, and that needs to be remedied. All of these games are presented through a beautifully crafted menu interface that nails the look and aesthetic of the X series. It's a real treat to look at whether it is clad in blue or green. Besides the games, Mega Man X Legacy Collection has a whole slew of extra content available. You have the gallery with hundreds of concept art and character profiles for each of the four games in a particular collection. Plus the beautiful new key art, created specifically for Mega Man X Legacy Collection. In Mega Man Classic Legacy Collection 1 and 2, you could click on the data profiles for the Robot Masters to initiate a practice boss battle with them. However, I'm sad to report that there is nothing like that in Mega Man X Legacy Collection. A shame really, because it would have been a great tool for practicing boss patterns for a mode that we'll get to in just a bit. On the positive side, I find the gallery here to be more intuitive than the Classic Legacy Collection, because you can flip through the images in full screen with the press of the triggers. Also, shoutouts to that super chill background music. Speaking of music, there is the music player where you can listen to your favorite tunes from across the four titles included in the collection. In addition, Capcom has created a whole new soundtrack for Mega Man X Legacy Collection. Some of these are remixes of old favorites, while many of these tunes are entirely original compositions. You'll be hearing most of this new original soundtrack throughout the collection's menus and X Challenge mode, from the rocking the world of X and give it a shot, to the chill but blood pumping gravity, the remixes of boss battles for Mega Man X1 through X6, and not to mention RE Future, which I won't spoil where it plays, this soundtrack is honestly amazing. I loved it when I was listening to the previews prior to release, and I love it even more after hearing the full versions. The highlight for myself and many others has to be the remix of the X5 boss theme. It is so good, 
and every time it came up while playing Next Challenge Volume 2, it really got me pumped up to hunt some Mavericks. The weakest part was definitely the XX Boss Remix though. It plays in X Challenge 2 as all the boss themes do, but it doesn't really fit the mood of the intense battles that X Challenge offers, even though the tune itself grew on me after a little while. You can listen to all these pieces of music in the music gallery, and pressing the full screen button brings up a clip of pre-recorded footage from the 4 games in your collection, and X Challenge. So you have something to watch while you listen to the music, which is a feature I can get behind. I also welcome the addition of looping and shuffling in the music player, which is a basic thing to add, but something that the classic legacy collections lacked. Improvements are improvements. Sadly, like the classic legacy collections though, you cannot listen to the music outside the music player. So while I love the gallery music that is already there, I would have liked the option to listen to other tunes on my choosing while browsing the artwork. Artwork isn't the only thing available to browse through in Mega Man X Legacy Collection though, as now we're going to get into the content that is the same between both collections. Get your uchi faces on! The product gallery lets you take a look at Mega Man X merchandise from throughout the years, including action figures, capsule toys, cards, apparel, soundtrack boxes, and books. The card section even has hundreds of the famous card-ass Mega Man X Mega Mission cards, so this is a really neat thing to look through. You can sort through them by category and by date. Next we have the trailer section where, as you might guess, contains old promotional videos for each X title, both in Japanese and English, though there are only English trailers for X8. And yes, the selection of trailers here are the same between both collections. There is no trailer available for X3 sadly, but the ones that are here are nice to look back on, and there are even some really fascinating beta elements contained in Mega Man X1's Japanese trailer. My only gripe of this section is the lack of a full screen option which is weird that they didn't think to add one. Oh and on the Nintendo Switch, the system does not allow you to take any screenshots or video of the trailers. The same is true for the PlayStation 4 share feature as well. Speaking of, the screenshotting and video taking feature of the Switch is fully implemented here, so you should have no problem sharing your favorite moments on social media. Included in both Mega Man X Legacy collections is the final part of the museum. The Day of Sigma animated movie that was originally included in Mega Man Maverick Hunter X on the PSP. Which makes the exclusion of the X1 remake from this collection even weirder. You could tell that the movie came from the PSP too, because the footage is noticeably upscaled to HD resolutions rather than being remastered. So while it's not crystal clear, it's still totally watchable and looks nice enough on the Switch's handheld screen. For those not in the know, the Day of Sigma tells the origin story of the Mega Man X series, the early days of X and Zero working as Maverick Hunters, and seeing the main villain of the series, Sigma, going from commander of the Maverick Hunters to leader of the Mavericks. So if you are at all interested in the lore of the Mega Man X series, this is definitely a recommended watch. It's worth mentioning however that Mega Man Maverick Hunter X has its own alternate continuity since Inafune wanted to remake all the X games of the X6, but never got the chance due to Maverick Hunter X's poor sales. So there are some contradicting things in this film like Dr. Kane being killed off when he was still alive and well in the SNES games. Other than the Day of Sigma OVA though, there are no other references to this alternate timeline present in Mega Man X Legacy Collection. And while most of the X games are infamous for their subpar voice acting, that is not the case for the Day of Sigma. The Mega Man X8 cast returns for the OVA, and once again, Mark Gotha and Lucas Gilbertson absolutely nailed their roles as X and Zero respectively. The controls for the film are pretty basic though. You can only pause, play, and choose between one of four chapters. There's no rewind or fast forward functions here which would have been nice but it's not here. Another feature that is integrated into the experience of Mega Man X Legacy Collection is the achievements or hunter medals as they're called. You can take a look through the hunter medals in their own section in the options menu and there are about 50 of them per collection. The hunter medal function is nice because it means even the Nintendo Switch version has an achievement system so nobody misses out. A pop up will show on screen every time you fulfill a requirement for a hunter medal. Those requirements can range from collecting all items in a game, browsing the art and music galleries, completing specific challenges, to simply being a game. You can even unlock something after getting enough hunter medals, so definitely go for it. Do you have what it takes to collect all the hunter medals? Other options include changing the language, but that isn't necessary because with the simple press of the Y button on the Switch, you can change the game region on the game menu. That means yep, Rockman X1 through X8 is all here in Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2. Next up is screen settings. You can set the screen size in three ways. Original aspect ratio as per console specs, 
4x3 as they were originally displayed on televisions back in the day, and 16x9, but not true 16x9 support. The image is stretched out instead. Then you have the filter options which is available for Mega Man X1 through X6. Type 1 is a smoothing filter that's meant to smooth out the pixels when they are blown up on an HD screen, and while I can appreciate the dot, the smoothing filter in reality looks a bit ugly and loses some of the detail on the characters and backgrounds in the process, so I tend to turn the filter off. Type 2 is a scan line filter that imitates the look of CRT televisions back in the day. There are also wallpapers that represent each X tile included in the collection that you can put up alongside your game screen. Only one from each game though, so there isn't many options at all especially compared to the offerings of Mega Man Classic Legacy Collection 2. There are two special unlockable wallpapers though which I'll talk about how to unlock them in my secrets video coming up. The good news at least is that you can mix and match wallpapers with games, so if you want to put the expert wallpaper on X1, go ahead. Of course, for you guys that don't like the distracting images next to your game, you can also choose to turn off wallpapers entirely and keep the black border. All the filters and wallpaper options apply to X Challenge too. Now there is one more feature I need to talk about, and that is the Rookie Hunter mode which is available for all 8 X titles and can be toggled from the main menu or in the in-game sub-menu. As the name implies, Rookie Hunter mode is designed to help newcomers to the X series, or those who aren't as experienced in gaming in general, enjoy the games without being roadblocked by the difficulty that the X titles are generally known for. So let me break down how exactly each Rookie Hunter mode changes up each X title. Courtesy of the surprisingly insightful in-game manual, in Mega Man X1, any damage is reduced to 25%. This stacks with the 50% armor defense bonus by the way. In Mega Man X2 and X3, damage is also reduced to 25%, and in some cases you will not even take any damage at all. In Mega Man X4 through X8, damage is reduced by 25% and sometimes you won't take damage once again. In addition, after taking damage, you will be invincible for twice as long. Your attack power increases by 50%, you start with 9 lives, except for in X8, spikes and other traps will damage you, but not kill you instantly. If you fall into a pit, you will be transported back to a nearby platform. Some platforms cannot be used though. And lastly, the ride chaser speed is slower than normal in X4, X5, and X8. Now, they're not kidding when they say that sometimes you won't take any damage at all, because there are times in Rookie Hunter mode that the damage you intake is so minimal that you are practically invincible. So in that way, Rookie Hunter mode is honestly too easy and eliminates all of the challenge. Still, like I said, this is okay for your younger siblings, children, or elderly folks to use to experience the X titles, so I'm not going to say no to an option, it's just there. One more thing you should know about Rookie Hunter mode is that you won't get the Hunter medal for completing the game if you turn on Rookie Hunter at any point in your playthrough. I learned the hard way that is very strict on that, because I turned on Rookie Hunter mode for one stage in next 2 while I was testing it out for my review. Then I turned Rookie Hunter mode back off and went on to complete X2 and found out that I didn't get the game complete Hunter medal. So yeah, don't make the same mistake I did. If you want the achievement, don't turn on Rookie Hunter mode at any point. Chief among the new content is the new X challenge mode where the key gimmick is you are pitted against two Maverick bosses at the same time. A concept that hasn't been fully explored in the series up until this point. So, does this idea work in practice? Let's break down how X Challenge works. In all of X Challenge mode, you play as Mega Man X in his shiny new armor that still hasn't been given an official name yet, even in the game itself. The armor looks like a recolor of the ultimate armor, but in functionality, it plays exactly like X5's fourth armor, except now you can use the Z Saber because this is X6X X we're talking about here. The armor allows you to fire a plasma charge shot that leaves a damaging plasma ball where the shot connects. Plasma power! And the air dash and hovering for maneuverability options, plus the standard 50% damage reduction and the ability to charge up special weapons. There is no giga attack to speak of either. The main feature of the X challenge armor then is the ability to equip special weapons from across the X series. In this case, X1 through X6. There is no content or bosses from X7 or X8 featured in X Challenge. If you want some added difficulty, you can also press the start button to choose to forego the armor and special weapons entirely and play as normal X but with a foot part equipped. So you can still use the air dash and hover, but otherwise the other bonuses the armor grants is gone, and you will have to do a buster only run. I'm not sure why they don't let us use special weapons of normal X, but that's the way it is. As for the X Challenge armor's design, I think it looks absolutely stunning in the official artwork. I love it. 
Unfortunately, that awesomeness didn't translate over well into the in-game sprite, where the colors lack contrast, making it look like a bad fan recolor of the ultimate armor. The special weapon colors don't look great on it either, and they use the same red and orange color for fire-based special weapons and so on. So oftentimes the color scheme doesn't match the weapon as it was presented in their respective original games. A typical X challenge run will have you select 3 special weapons out of a predetermined list to take with you into a stage. There are 9 stages in total, each with 3 pairs of Mavericks to survive through. Also the third round in each stage has an exclusive pairing of Mavericks to either Legacy Collection 1 or 2. So that's 9 additional fights between the two collections, making for a total of 36 different battles in the games. There's no more than that. I heard some people hoping that you could create your own Maverick matchups, but I'm afraid to report that that is not the case. All the fights here are predetermined. Anyway, once you select your 3 weapons and start a run, you cannot switch them out between rounds. You have to carry on with your setup all the way through. Most of the special weapons you can choose from correspond to the weaknesses of each of their Mavericks in that stage. So since you only get 3 special weapons to deal with 6 Mavericks, there's a bit of strategy involved with choosing which weapons you're going to need the most to make it through the stage. The strategy I usually employed was figuring out which Maverick in a pair that was giving me the most trouble and bring that weapon I needed to take them out quickly. Or you could bring both weaknesses to make one particularly hard fight easier if you were comfortable with Buster running an easier fight. Regardless of what you do though, with only 3 special weapons available to you at any time, prepare to be using those charge shots a lot. Charge shot. That's the basics of X challenge. Pick 3 special weapons or go semi naked X only and fight through 3 rounds of double boss fights until you win the stage. If you run out of your 3 lives at any point though, you get a game over and have to do the stage from the top once again. Yep, all 3 rounds. So with that said, does this fighting 2 bosses at once idea work out in practice? Well, yes and no. There are some truly well designed and enjoyable fights here. Some of my favorites include fighting the Stormy Duo, Storm Owl and Storm Eagle on top of Eagle's aircraft, Spiral Pegasus and Dark Necrobat also on top of a plane, Chill Penguin and Frost Walrus in this giant arena, with Chill Penguin messing with your movement while Frost Walrus goes on the attack and laying down ice, a duel against Blizzard Wolf Thing and Burned Dino Rex of ice physics, playing with Metal Shark Player while Storm Eagle pushes you back and swoops in for aerial attacks. Using the holes in Crescent Grizzly stage to duck beneath Slash B's rush attacks. Chasing Cyber Peacock while Tunnel Rhino charges back and forth below. Just to name a few. But for every fun fight and cool combination, there is also a stage that is downright unfair. To the point that it can be an impossible feat to dodge attacks unless you are a Mega Man X God, maybe. I'm talking about things like asking a player to dodge Spiral Pegasus tackle attacks while Blaze Heatnix creates a pool of lava over your head blocking off your only way of escape in an already cramped area. X Challenge likes to do that a lot actually, where they put Spiral Pegasus in small places so your reaction time has to be on point to dodge. The fights of Vile and High Max as well as Dr. Doppler and God Car Machine Owen Nari are fun concepts, and on their own they weren't super hard bosses, but put them together and things quickly become a chaotic mess, where you have to hope that you can take out one of them fast enough before you die, so you can easily deal the other one 1v1. And unfortunately, that's where a bunch of fights in X Challenge boil down to. Taking hits from a literal bullet hell like situation while you try to kill one boss as quickly as possible. Because once you get one boss down, the fight becomes manageable again. I still like the concept of fighting two bosses and sometimes it does work, and I had a lot of fun with it. But most of the time, X Challenge is just too darn chaotic to even call it fair. Yes, I'm saying that X Challenge is stupid hard but not really in a good way all the time. A well designed boss fight would have a readable enough pattern that with enough practice, you can learn to make the fight easier for yourself. And while it's true that knowing the 1v1 boss fights beforehand can help your case in next challenge for sure, I cannot overlook the battles where I felt like I just had to get lucky to survive, even when I knew what I had to do. There's also a couple fights that I couldn't imagine doing normally if I wasn't able to cheese it with a certain special weapon combo. And you know you have a problem when I have to bust out the cheese. It also doesn't help that when you finish a fight in normal mode, your remaining HP carries over into the next one. So if you end one round of 1 HP, you're going to have 1 HP again when you start up the next round. Special weapon energy works the same way, though I did notice that some energy refills when you die, but it wasn't a consistent effect in my experience. 
That just makes things even more pointlessly difficult in my opinion. Carried over HP is an interesting concept on paper, but I always thought it would be a hard mode thing to spice up the difficulty when I first heard about it. Imagine my shock when I found out that it's actually a normal mode thing. By the way, there's no sub tanks available in X challenge mode, so it's either you win at the health you start with, or go home. On the bright side, at least this gives the 3 lives the game gives you a purpose. If you are good enough to win all 3 rounds without dying once, you get bonus points for your score that you can upload to the online leaderboards. But even then, there was many times when I found myself needing a full bar of HP to survive even one fight. So my strategy became getting through one fight, then purposely letting myself die at the start of the next round so I can do my real attempt with full health. Because if you needed a special weapon and you exhaust all of its energy before you die, you're probably boned because there's no guarantee you're getting that energy back. So I gotta ask at some point why this setup was even needed on the standard difficulty. I would say just give us one life, but refill our health in between fights and you would get the same thing I've been having to do 90% of the time. Just base the energy score bonus on how much health you end a fight with. Now you might be asking, if normal mode is that crazy, then what about hard mode? Well, hard mode is actually boring in comparison. You take more damage, Mavericks have more health, and that's about all I've noticed really. It does reinforce my point that this HP conservation mechanic should have been saved for hard mode to make it more interesting. As for easy mode, it's honestly way too easy. Yeah, at least they actually heal you and refill your special weapon ammo between fights in easy mode, but you deal significantly more damage to bosses so they drop like a fly pretty fast. You also tank hits ridiculously easy to the point that you would actually have to try to die on easy mode. To add insult to injury, defeated Mavericks drop health pickups, making it even easier to stay topped off on health. Just to tell you the difference, I beat X challenge in about an hour on easy mode. On the flip side, normal mode alone took me more or less 7 hours of practicing strats and several repeat attempts to brute force my way through. Now I don't want to be too harsh on X challenge, because despite my moments of frustration at points, I did still have a good time with it, and the fun I was having only increased as I sharpened my skills and realized that I can actually win. Yes, 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 I can win, I feel great, I can do this! I just think the normal mode difficulty could be toned down a bit, because as it is, I can see a lot of people giving up out of frustration before seeing the final battles. Which those final battles are ridiculously chaotic, and definitely the toughest fights in X challenge by far. But they do introduce a unique idea that I thought was super cool. I won't spoil it here, but I will talk about it in my secrets video just so I can gush about it because dang it's so cool dude. Anyway, if I had to offer up any further suggestions on how to make normal mode more fair, I would say either recovering the player's health by a certain percentage between rounds, or bringing in the health drops from easy mode would improve things for sure. I particularly like the health drop idea, and I think it could work in normal mode, because in easy mode it just served to be a moot point with how much defense you already had. In normal mode though, I think it could be a big help. Oh, and if you don't believe me about how tough X challenge mode is, let me just say that according to the online leaderboards on the Switch, out of every person on the planet Earth that ever received a review copy, yours truly, Shadowrock ZX, was the first and only reviewer who has ever cleared X challenge on the normal difficulty. Other reviewers like Protodude I talked to echoed my point that it's just too much, too chaotic. Now let's talk about X challenge's story, or wait, what story? Okay, so when you start up X Challenge for the first time, there is a cutscene played that explains that Mavericks you have slain in the past have come back, causing havoc. And that's literally it. That's all the story you get for the duration of the mode. I beat X Challenge on both easy and normal difficulties, and the only real thing of value that I unlocked besides some pretty pictures was a practice mode that lets you choose any individual fight at will so you can practice a particular pair of Mavericks that are giving you a hard time on any difficulty. For practice mode alone, I would say it would be wise to go through X Challenge on easy first, because being able to practice was a great tool for me to learning how to get through normal mode. I should mention too that hard mode is locked from the beginning, but it does unlock whenever you clear any difficulty. Other than that, yeah, nothing else on the story. You do get a cool secret final battle upon completing hard mode, which is the final unlock. I won't spoil the battle itself here, but you can check it out on my secrets video I'll put in the description below. 
Anyway, the requirement to get this final battle is honestly insane because like I said earlier, I can see a lot of players struggling on normal mode to begin with. Plus, you can't practice the final battle once you got it once. It's a one and done deal until you go through stage 9 once again. But hey, it's something a little extra for you true S-Class hunters. You know what would make X-Challenge better too? If the Maverick selection was more varied. I'm serious when I say that they could have done a lot better with the variety. They had 6 X games to choose Mavericks from, and 36 individual fights to place them in. But 36 fights doesn't feel like a lot when I'm seeing the same Mavericks over and over again. I really don't need to see Spiral Pegasus, Neon Tiger, and Bubble Crab like 4 different times. The variety is so poor to the point that when you reach the final stage, it's mostly Mavericks that you've already seen at that point. There's just too many duplicates when they had so many other perfectly iconic Mavericks to choose from. What happened to Launch Octopus? Boomer Kowanger? Flame Mammoth? Flame Stag? Overdrive Ostrich? The list goes on and on. It's like they picked about 4 Mavericks per game and called it a day. And I can totally understand if some of these bosses I mentioned would just add to the chaos already present in X Challenge. It just gets tiring seeing the same Maverick again and again but paired with someone else. Worse, there's some one-off Mavericks that only appear in one round, and oftentimes that round is exclusive to one collection or the other. That's why in both the story and Maverick variety department, X Challenge did leave me a bit disappointed. Not gonna lie. The highlights are definitely the special fights that happen every three stages that feature end bosses like the already revealed High Max and Vile. Oh, and shoutouts once again to the awesome Mega Man X Legacy Collection soundtrack made specifically for X Challenge Mode, providing some awesome boss theme remixes like I talked about before, and other great new tunes on top of that. X Challenge also features remixed sound effects. Many of those are ripped from X8, while some sound like entirely new sound effects. Though a lot of the new sound effects are a bit on the generic side, so if you find that you aren't a fan of the new sound effects, you can hop into the menu and switch to the original sound effects from the X games. Furthermore, if you also hate the remix music, you can have the original boss music play too. I like options like that. So there's X Challenge, a mode that quickly enters the realm of pure chaos, but there is definitely fun to be had for veteran players looking for a tough challenge. Oh, you'll be getting it, trust me because I was not prepared for X Challenge. X Challenge is not without its problems, but overall as I keep saying, I did have fun of it still, and I'm still a fan of the concept. The battles are super intense, and actually completing the final boss fight in normal mode is probably the hardest thing I've done in a Mega Man game in a long time, but equally was my feeling of accomplishment when I finally did it. It's a nice side distraction from the main games that I definitely liked better than the challenges from the classic legacy collections, of which there are none of those in this collection, it's just X Challenge. This was a really novel idea, but I wouldn't say X Challenge sells Mega Man X Legacy Collection on its own. The main draw is always going to be the main titles. That said, I would be interested if Capcom would flesh out X Challenge in the future, maybe as its own standalone game with an actual story this time and playable zero? Yep, there's no playable zero in X Challenge as far as I know. It is called X Challenge after all. Overall, Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2 is a nice little package for fans of the X series or newcomers getting into the series for the first time on X's 25th anniversary. It's not perfect, of course. There's been a few changes made to the main X titles, some for the better and some questionable changes for the worst. As nice as X7 and X8 in HD are, many issues with the other existing games have not been fixed, so I think this is going to be a hard sell for the longtime fans that have already owned all the X games. Since not all the X games are created equal, and certainly not all will immediately offer a better experience over the originals, aside from the HD picture quality. However, despite the imperfections, it's clear that a good deal of effort went into preserving these games and preparing the extra content, and those efforts should be commended. The controls are responsive, and the emulation is pretty good from my experience. These games all play just like I remember them. Well, except for that game breaking glitch in Mega Man X7. You see, Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 is actually pretty good. Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2, however, is a mixed bag. X5 and X8 are decent to great games, but X7 alone weighed this collection down by a lot. And glitches like the one we discussed in X7 are inexcusable. 
That needs to be patched as soon as possible. The collections themselves are good, but things like that going on under the hood cannot be ignored. Still, if you are interested in getting into the Mega Man X series, you like to have every X title on one convenient console, or you just wanted to get every game on the Switch to take on the go like I do, then I recommend this collection to you. This is a fine way to own the Mega Man X series, and being able to take some of my favorite Mega Man games ever with me wherever I go with the Switch is a truly liberating feeling. There's still no Mega Man X9 hints that have been found in the collections, but if you guys really want to Mega Man X9, I'm serious when I say that buying Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2 really is the best way to show Capcom that you care about the X series continuing. If the success of Mega Man Legacy Collection led to Mega Man 11, then surely the further success of the X Legacy Collection can bring about a new Mega Man X title after 14 years of waiting. Besides, right now it's the best way to buy the whole Mega Man X series since $20 individually or $40 for both collections is a lot cheaper than buying each game by themselves. Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2 is available now on Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC. Don't bother the PC version right now though. There's a lot of reports coming in that the PC version has a lot of really bad problems with slowdown right now. Hopefully they get around to patching that really soon. And now with all the Mega Man X Legacy Collection reviews done, now we can focus our sights to the future to Mega Man 11 which is coming on October 2nd, and whatever else Mega Man has in store for us beyond. Hopefully X9 is part of those plans. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching, and for more on Mega Man X and everything else Mega Man 2, stay tuned to Shadow Rock ZX. Until next time, rock on!